Good morning, bonjour, bon dia, buenos dias, uh, dear colleagues, dear friends. Uh, it is an honor to have you all here in the European Parliament in Brussels, Brussels to talk about Africa in the 21st century, old and new borders, federalism, and self-determination. As you all well know, African borders are perhaps amongst the most uh, artificial in the planet. Artificial and imposed borders that had to create nations or that united different peoples or that superimposed and manipulated territories and landscapes. Africa, as Europe, is a continent rich in heritage, linguistic and cultural diversity. Africa is the protagonist of the current century. Africa is the second largest continent on earth and the second most populated with 1.4 billion Africans according to the latest projections. And last but not least, is the youngest by far with an average age of 19 years old, half of Europe's 24 years. But borders are here in Europe and there in Africa to stay or perhaps to be modified. In Africa, they are a continuous source of uh, conflicts that too often end in bloody wars and serious violations of human rights. We are aware that it is the de delicate issue in Africa as well as in Europe, and we had our own experience in Catalonia. As a member of the European Parliament delegation for relation with the Pan-African Parliament, we thought that we had to dedicate an event to some of the trends happening in Africa, that of claims for changing policies within federations or new nations. South Sudan became an independent nation only in 2011. It is proof that borders change. In this case, after a long war, unfortunately. On the other hand, Somaliland is struggling to maintain its statehood since the first declaration of independence in 1960, as former British Somalia, and since the second declaration in 1991 from Somalia. International recognition is hard to achieve, even proving that Somaliland is the most stable country in the Horn of Africa, but the recent agreement with Taiwan is a reason for hope in the near future. In other cases, as in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, there are alternative proposals involving federal or autonomous systems trying to accommodate different regions and peoples in a giant country the size of Western Europe of more than 100 million people and 241 spoken languages. After a long war, the eastern region of Kibu is still experiencing turmoil and conflict as we speak. I believe that all political proposal, federalism, autonomy, independence, or unitary, un, unitary state are equal legitimate only if they are adopted with the consent of the peoples and nations involved. Today, our speakers are here to discuss these cases and hopefully bring new insights to very complex political processes. Today, 8th March, is the International Women's Day. It is therefore an honor to come on two of the speakers who have been involved in defending women's rights in their respective African countries. Mrs. Edna Adan Ismail, a former Minister of Foreign Affairs of Somaliland, is a long time defender of women's rights and vacant uh, in her homeland, Somaliland. Her struggle against uh, female genital mutilation is an inspiration for many women in many countries. Dr. Pierrot Chambou has been also involved in the struggle for women's rights, collaborating in Kibu with Dr. Bukwebe, the uh, 2018 Nobel Peace Prize, 
in the denunciation of rape and sexual abuses against women and infants as a war weapons. We can also count on Mr. Marcelin Chikuru Chambu, who is visiting Europe for the first time after his long political imprisonment in Democratic Republic of Congo for more than 20 years. Welcome, bienvenue, bienvenidos, so the whole caribou. Without further ado, let's uh, listen to the three exceptional African voices directly without any intermediaries. I am sure that from their experiences, we will learn many lessons. Let's just start with uh, Mrs. Edna Nan Ismail, who will speak about the case of statehood for Somaliland, uh, about 20, 25 minutes, feel free. Uh, Thank you. So the floor, the floor is yours, madam. Um, thank you very much, Mr. President, and uh, honourable members of the European Parliament, uh, dear guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honour to be in the European Parliament once again. And once again, I bring you greetings from the people of Somaliland. And before I make my presentation, I would like to give you a background of my country, Somaliland, because it's often very much confused with other countries that, whose names start with Somali. My country, British, former British Somaliland Protectorate, was established in 1884. And it was granted full independence and sovereignty through a proclamation from Her Late Majesty the Queen on the 26th of June, 1960. At that time, it became the first African, it became the 12th African country to be independent and the first Somali country to become independent because, as you all know, there was La Côte Française de Somalie, which is a French colony, La Somalia Italiana, which was an Italian colony. There's a portion of Somali people living in Kenya. There's another portion living in the Somali region of Ethiopia. And then there was British Somaliland Protectorate. And that title gives us a unique identity that Somaliland has never been colonized. We have a treaty of protection with Great Britain, but we have always been sovereign and had that agreement, that treaty of protection with Great Britain. And that treaty is what allowed our people during the First World War and the Second World War to fight alongside the Allies. When Somaliland became independent on the 26th of June, 1960, we became the 12th African country and there were still 34 countries from Africa who are now sitting in the African Union who were still under colonial rule at the time when Somaliland was independent. And among those 34 colonized people still under colonial rule, there was La Somalia Italiana. Therefore, Somaliland and Somalia, when they united on the 1st of July, 1960, it was a union between two independent sovereign nations. It was not the conquest of one over the other, but it was a voluntary agreement with Somaliland being the senior partner because Somaliland had gained independence one week before Somalia. Fortunately, 
some unions work, but unfortunately also, some do not. Some partnerships don't work. Some marriages don't work. Countries unite, find it useful, and grow on, and grow on this. Others find this union non-favorable to the partners who united, and they separate. And such separation came about between Senegal and Gambia, two independent sovereign nations who united, but three years later decided that they were better off as friends, as neighbors, rather than being united in a union they did not feel comfortable in. Um, Somaliland and Somalia found their union difficult. Our Somali language was different. Our culture was different. Our traditions were different. The colonial partners that we each had were different. Our system of administration was different. I'm not saying one was better than the other, but we were different. And that difference made it difficult to continue with our partnership. And then when our people voiced their decision that they wished to withdraw from that union and go back to the drawing board and rediscuss the terms of union, punitive actions took place against the people of my country, Somaliland. We entered into a 10-year civil war from 1982 to 91. Those punitive acts were perpetrated by Somalis on Somalis. People who had the same religion and who had ethnic similarities. When Somalia refused to listen to the will of the people of Somaliland, movements that were pushing for the separation and from the, for the withdrawal of that union were massacred, were bombed, were shot, were put into mass graves. They were shot not by a sniper or two, but the cities were bombed by MiG airplanes by military tanks against civilian populations. We separated from Somalia because these massacres were perpetrated against our people. Somalia perpetrated crimes against humanity, against our people. They flattened schools, they flattened homes, they flattened hospitals with sick people inside them. They filled the bodies of school children into mass graves after bleeding them to death and using their bodies as mobile blood banks. And mothers would tell children, if troops come into your school, don't stand up straight, particularly if that child was tall. Don't stand up straight because you will be identified as somebody. You come over and you will be bled to death. Hundreds of Somalilanders were massacred. Over a million sought refuge in Ethiopia that became a place that held the biggest population refugees at that time. Hartashir, 
you must have heard about it in the late 80s and early 90s. Others went to Yemen, to Djibouti, and beyond, and many came to the shores of Europe and North America and elsewhere, wherever they could find shelter. Ladies and gentlemen, 100 mass graves were identified by UN forensic experts in Somaliland, many of them holding the bodies of children who were no military threat to anybody. How dangerous is a five-year-old or a three-year-old? I fail to understand. But shamefully, although these mass graves were identified by UN forensic experts, human rights organizations have done nothing about this or said nothing about this genocide and this massacre. And I would like to refer you to a document that was published by the United Nations, uh, United States um, Human Rights Watch, and the title of which is A Government at War with Its Own People. It's available online. I would request you to kindly read it. But where are we today in Somaliland? Once we ousted the troops of Siad Barhe, the troops of Somalia, Somaliland closed its borders where the British had left it. We then embarked on an energetic reconstruction of our country with our own resources. Because Somaliland is not recognized, we were denied aid, we were denied help, and we could only rely on ourselves. But before reconstruction could take place, ladies and gentlemen, peace and stability had to be secured. The massive militia that defeated the troops of Siad Barre had to be demobilized in order for government structures to be put in place. And to achieve this, we developed our constitution, which we had it approved by the people, and 95% of our people approve the constitution. We are proud, ladies and gentlemen, that Somaliland has now been peaceful for 32 years. All the news you hear about the Somali coasts is not from Somaliland. We have held a succession of elections, presidential elections, parliamentary elections, local government elections, where every man and woman who is 18 years and over has a right to vote. In Somaliland, we generate our own resources. We defend our country. We train and run our police force. We have our own currency our own passports. We also rely on ourselves to rebuild our country. We have established our local and regional courts. We run our government affairs. We provide health and education and service, social services to our people. We run a peaceful country where a woman like me, I'm an 85 year old woman, I drive my own car in the streets of Hargeisa, and I drive from city to city without a need for bodyguard or without for anybody to protect me because I live in Somaliland where it's peaceful and it's stable, where I could invite any single one of you to come with me tomorrow and I will drive you through the streets, as do the many foreigners who live in Somaliland. By contrast, our neighbor Somalia, that is recognized by the international community, depends on international aid and depends on international peacekeeping forces. 
I'm sure that anyone who Googles Somaliland will see the images of beautiful modern cities that have attracted tourists. We get tourists from, from the Far East. We recently had some tourists from Japan. We get tourists from anywhere in the world. We have also attracted foreign workers who come en masse to find jobs in Somaliland. And we have returned hundreds and thousands of our people from the diaspora. When by contrast, Somalia has been continuously sending out a steady stream of refugees to the world, while Somaliland has been a society founded on peace, justice, and the rule of law. Diplomatic presence in Somaliland. Yes, we're not recognized politically, but although Somaliland is not politically recognized by countries, by any country, it nevertheless hosts the presence of many UN agencies. The UN has an office in Somaliland. International NGOs have offices in Somaliland. And an increasing number of countries who have representatives or trade offices in Somaliland live with us, such as Taiwan, the United Kingdom, Denmark, Ethiopia, Kenya, UAE, Djibouti, and also the US, after the state, uh, the Senate passed the bill to reestablish a presence in, in Berbera, there is an American presence. This has earned Somaliland the description of an area of special sovereignty by the National Geographic. And hopefully this recognition of our much deserved sovereignty will become a reality soon. Our economy is the envy of many. It is increasingly attracting foreign investors from the East and from the West who wish to do business with us. And an outstanding example is the investment by DP World and the United Kingdom who between them have invested half a billion US dollars to turn the port of Berbera into an international marine hub. That proves that there is stability in Somaliland. Nobody invests half a billion US dollars in a country where they feel their investment would not be safe. Britain is building the corridor, that road between Berbera and Ethiopia. And others are investing in smaller investments, in industry, in manufacture, in agriculture, fisheries, and of course, in real estate. Recently, our oil explorations have confirmed the presence of oil in commercial quantities in at least three sites, offshore and onshore. Somaliland has a coastline of 850 kilometers long and which is pirate free. We are strategically located at the mouth of the Red Sea where 12% of the world's ships pass through. We keep those waters free of terrorists, not only to keep Somaliland safe, but also to keep world shipping lanes safe. Somaliland keeps watch. Our waters are also rich in marine resources that are waiting to be exploited in sensible and modern, modern manner. Currently, clandestine fishing licenses are issued by Somalia to foreign trawlers who are destroying the marine ecology inside the waters of Somaliland. We invite organizations who, like us, are concerned about the environment to join their efforts with our, to ours to protect the marine resources that belong 
to all of us. Somaliland has mineral resources also. We have gold, we have diamonds, we have emeralds. I did not bring my emerald diamond today. I came by train, so I don't like to wear metal emeralds. And we have the world's biggest gypsum deposit. Second in quality only to the gypsum in Canada, which we believe has the best quality in the world. We're waiting for investors to help us process this gypsum into cement and to other byproducts. In regard to borders, at the time of our independence on 26 June 1960, Somaliland became a country that is sovereign and safe. And we live and respect the borders as they existed at the time of our independence when we gained our independence from Britain. And we live within those same borders today. Somaliland reaffirms its peace, its commitment to peace and stability of the region, which includes unreserved respect for the unity and the territorial integrity of nations. We stand neither for the cessation nor for the fragmentation or the revision of African borders. Ladies and gentlemen, our withdrawal from our union with Somalia does not make us the first sovereign African sta state to have entered into a voluntary union with another sovereign state and subsequently withdrawn from that union intact. Egypt and Syria, Senegal and Gambia, Senegal and Mali, all have done the same and have never been punished for, for doing that as Somaliland has been punished for the past 32 years for doing exactly what these countries have done. Ladies and gentlemen, the future for Somaliland is bright and is like a light that shines from the dark side of the moon. Although our peace and stability have been threatened by terrorists and Shabab attacks from Somalia in recent weeks, in the areas surrounding Las Anod, Somaliland's track record of over three decades of stability has helped us to build the good relations that we have with neighboring states. Our growing trade and economy are also the cornerstones of our foreign policy, which envisions a more stable, democratic, peaceful, and prosperous Horn of Africa. We believe in our Sunni Islam religion, which does not condone acts of terrorism nor fundamentalism ideologies. The constitution gives freedom of expression, freedom of assembly, and freedom of education to our men and to our women alike. And in fact, 75% of the students in my university, the Edna Adan University, are female. We hope that this light that shines on Somaliland will herald a new dawn that will bring justice to the pe people of Somaliland. People who have a right to be heard, to be seen, and to be recognized as responsible members of the international community because Somaliland has never been part of Africa's problems. Instead, Somaliland has the political maturity and the African wisdom that our continent needs to bring peace to neighboring Somalia. And Somaliland needs to be part of the nations of the world who are genuinely searching for solutions to Africa's problems. And ladies and gentlemen, Somaliland is ready, is willing, and is able to take on that responsibility. Somaliland has been unjustly punished for the, for the sins of others, 
for far too long. For reasons unknown to us, Somalia, who has been the cause of our problems and of our destruction, has been left with the authority to represent us, when in fact, we have been separate far longer than we have been united. We wonder, where else in the world has the aggressor ever been given the authority to represent the victim? I don't think Hitler would have represented, could have represented the people in the concentration camps as their legal defense. But Somalia, who has been the cause of the massacre of hundreds of thousands of Somalis, is now representing us Please think about it. Somaliland instead needs to be welcomed back from its unjust exile to the dark side of the moon. Our voice must be heard. Our case must be given its day in court. And at last, justice needs to prevail because there is no reunification with Somalia, with fragmented Somalia, with chronically unstable Somalia that has done so much evil to our country and has been a haven for warlords, pirates, terrorists, and Shabab for the past three decades. And finally, ladies and gentlemen, as we have done for the past 32 years, we in Somaliland continue to extend a hand of friendship to our neighbor Somalia for the initiation of serious dialogue, to find peaceful resolutions to our differences, so that our people may at last find peace on both sides of the border. And if we had peace, ladies and gentlemen, we could join our efforts to find solutions for our common problems caused by drought, caused by food insecurity, malnutrition in our people. Our resources could become better used to prevent and treat the diseases that are killing our people, and particularly our women and our children. And finally, we would better educate our youth, create jobs for them, prevent them from being trafficked to Europe and to beyond, only to drown in foreign waters or die in foreign prisons. Ladies and gentlemen, I sincerely hope and pray that wisdom will finally prevail and that peace and stability may finally return to the entire Horn of Africa. And I sincerely wish to thank honorable members of the European Parliament and to His Excellency, Honorable Carles Pichdemont for inviting us to this conference. And I thank you all for your attention and for your welcome. Thank you.